whether you love four-wheeled vehicles or two-wheeled vehicles. Antonio, what should people do? Subscribe. Right now. Welcome to the Audrain Automobile Museum and our exhibition, History Luxury Sport, Automobiles in Newport. And we're going to talk about very different vehicles in this uh, segment, and uh, not giving away too much yet, but not yet. Um, it shows the variety of the vehicles in this show, all of which are connected with the Audrain Newport Concord d'Elegance or with Newport and its great personalities itself. And speaking of great personalities of Newport, Ben Chester. Thank you, Donald. That's very <laughs> kind of you. I did not expect that, actually. So You see? Are. Exactly. That's what we're all about here at the Audrain Surprises. And this is Boom. no <laughs> We always talk about our favorites in every exhibition. We have to be so careful, but you know, um, this is one of my favorites in the show, and I know it's one of yours as well. Well, they're all my favorites, Donald. <laughs> can't, you can't pick favorites. They're like your children. No, you can't. But we did an exhibition, a notable exhibition, a few years ago here at the Audrain called New England Hot Rods. And it was really something very special to open up the eyes of people that didn't realize the place that New England had in the hot rod and custom car scene of the 1940s and 50s. And uh, one of the cars that was featured in that show was a Ford Coupe built by a New England legend, Fred Steele. And uh, he was quite a character <laughs> by all accounts, all the folks that knew him in uh, the group that he was a member of, the Tie Rods. I think it's the oldest uh, um, custom car club in New England, certainly, and still going strong today. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, one of the youngest members of the Tie Rod, our friend Brian Lennox, loaned us this car, another Fred Steele car, Fred's Lead Sled. Yes. This is an amazing thing. It, it is an amazing thing. And Brian's an amazing guy. Fred's an amazing guy. We can't thank Brian enough for helping us out with another exhibition. Uh, but talk about larger than life personalities. <laughs> Fred Steele should be in the dictionary under larger than life personalities. He was instrumental in growing the hot rod community, not just to New England, but it seemed like once it caught on here, it spread like wildfire um, in everywhere except California. Um, he ended up acquiring this um, after it was customized and uh, seeing, you know, uh, Hot Rod Magazine and all these crazy road trips that these enthusiasts were going on, he decided it was his turn and ended up taking this action on a 9,000 mile trip, clearly not there and back with a few stops along the way, in this car here. And since Brian has become the historian of the tie rods within the last year, he's been showing some archival videos and photos of that trip and we've seen some stuff. Uh, from Fred and the group that went out there and it adds up to his personality for sure. It is great hearing that because it tells me a number of things. It reminds me of a number of things. First of all, cars are meant to be driven. Um, and also one of the things that I love about the hot rod and custom car scene is that cars are always projects. They're never quite done. And uh, this car was actually built and started by a fellow in New Jersey named Paul Vigilant. And um, he had some really interesting ideas. The car had a very, very different frontal aspect with uh, 59 Lincoln slanted quad headlights mm -hmm. and it was red, a very, very different car. Uh, he slightly over-engined it apparently and wrecked it. Mm. Uh, wrecked the front end and Fred bought it and I won't say restored it, but he repaired the car and made it to his own taste. And I think frankly, this, the 1950 Mercury, first of all, let's take a step back. One of the favorite cars of customizers in America is the 1950 Mercury. Mm -hmm. And it's not surprising because frankly, this like the um, 48 Hudson were cars that yes. looked like custom cars yes. from the factory. Yes. So you didn't have to go far to really get an incredible look. And this has got a chopped roof. It's not channeled because you don't need to channel a 50 Mercury right. because it's already got a sleek enough body. Yep. And it's absolutely astonishing what you can do the look of this car, you know how much I love design. Yeah. I mean, this is every bit the equal of any European coach built car. Absolutely. I mean, it is just absolutely gorgeous. And it's all about the details, the uh, hidden antenna, mm -hmm. the French headlights. I mean, this is an astonishing car. And as you said, the pictures of Fred on his epic 
journey across the country uh, with his family, by the way. Mm. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, also, which uh, resulted in the spectacular interior the car has. Yes. A Tijuana tuck and roll interior. Yes. Done in Tijuana. <laughs> yes. That's, that's the extra mileage that he did on the trip. But it, with all of Fred's builds, uh, not just this 50 Mark, they were so tastefully done. They were never overdone. There's not too much going on. There are a lot of special details, we'll say, about this car that you might not see immediately uh, when you approach the car. But the interior is well done. You see the, f uh, the floor mats in there are basically uh, look like something right off a bear. Um, <laughs> and everything just adds up to make this, this custom that doesn't even seem too customized because it fits so well. If you never knew what a stock 50 Mercury Coupe looked like, you would think, oh, this is a 1950 Mercury Coupe. Honestly. And it's, uh, it's great though, the things that they did, like the removing the door handles and putting yes. in the buttons, those are buttons from a 1948 Continental. And uh, you know, just all these little things that a factory could have done, or as I said before, a coach builder could have yes. made. And the other thing which is so wonderful is the fact that um, the tie rods, also such an interesting group, because they, they were a car club, and they are also trying to fight against the perception of hot rodders and customizers as hooligans and bad boys. Yep. Yep. And one of the neatest things that, that Brian showed us, and they still do this day, is little courtesy cards. When you had a problem on the road and broke down at a flat tire, one of the tie rides would stop and help you, and they just give you a card. They said, oh, please, don't give us any money, don't give us a tip. Just know that you were helped yeah. by a member of the tie rod. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It was a great tool to spread the word about the club and let them know that they weren't just all bad boys, right? And um, it was very difficult in Massachusetts because there were um, enforcement out on the streets to ensure that you know your car was uh, the proper height off the road and your headlights were at the proper height and all these different things that really didn't have anything to do with how the car drove. <laughs> so it was very frustrating for the group, but um, they prevailed and helped hot riding become this cultural icon, not, even, not just in this country, not just on this coast, but there's a huge culture in Japan, in Europe. So even still to this day, the tie rods are very active um, in hot rodding. And just recently, they hosted their old timers reunion, which in, his, in its 50th year uh, of consecutive gathering, which is really magnanimous, uh, just to think about. It is also so wonderful that we get to celebrate cars like this and this particular car, not only in exhibitions in the museum, but also at the Concorde d'Elegance itself, because we had a special class, which this car won a class prize in. and. It's so important for us to share all types of cars. Yes. It's one of the things I really love about this exhibition is the fact that you have everything here from you know, a 1980 BMW yes. to this wonderful 1950 Mercury Custom yes. to a 1901 Winton. Yes. It's all the expression of automotive passion and ingenuity and, and design and excellence. It's it, just fantastic. It absolutely is. And this car stands out walking down the aisle, <laughs> uh, a big yellow Mercury. A lot of people might say, well, what the hell is this doing here? The reality is it's the era that this was built in, in the 40s and 50s, that really took automotive enthusiasm and car modifications as a whole and moved it along through the generations. And to me, I don't think American car culture would be the same without these guys. Absolutely not. Thank you very much, Ben. And now we're going to look at something very different, but still very much in the coach-built reign. Thanks. Now we've just seen an example of superb coachwork in that custom Merc. Now we're going to see two more examples of custom coachwork, this time a very different variety, but custom coachwork that was very much a part of Newport's golden age. And who better to celebrate Newport golden age coachwork than Nicholas Waller, the executive director of the Audrey Newport Concorde d'Elegance. Oh, you're very kind, Nick. Donald. These are two fabulous cars to discuss, and I think it is interesting to compare them with the custom before, because they're not custom. <laughs> and they also express so many different things. The time in which they were built, mm -hmm. the incredibly interesting people for whom they were yes. built, and what they represent then and today in terms of custom coach building. We have two cars from 1938, a 1938 Packard 12, Landelay by Rolston, coach builders of New York, 
and a 1938 Ford Deluxe with a customized body by Brewster. And so <laughs> these two cars were also built at a time when things were not terrific yet. The Depression was still very much on in 1938. Yeah. Uh, the economy really wouldn't recover until after the country came into World War II. And so these represent two very different views of how a person of wealth could express themselves with cars. I think you're absolutely right, because you had to be sensitive to the time. America had suffered for 10 years, almost. And to flaunt your wealth at one time in the 20s had been all the rage, and everybody jazzed it up in the jazz era. Now, 10 years, eight, nine, 10 years down the road of hardship, you wanted luxury. You wanted to be comfortable in what you had, because you had money, there's no getting away from it. But you wanted a car that wasn't quite as in your face as it might have been in the 20s. And these two cars, especially, we'll, we'll talk about the one we're closest to first, this Packard. Now, what's also very interesting about this Packard is the fact that, as one does, the original owner, a 26-year-old woman, decided to buy a new car. Yeah. So she buys a Packard 12 chassis, commissions Rolston to build a Landolet, and uh, not Land Lakes, that's butter, but a Landolet, <laughs> which is a convertible town car, yeah. uh, and off she goes. Yeah. Well, I think it shows the personality of its owner, Doris Duke. And <laughs> wouldn't you have loved to have been a friend? I would have loved <laughs> to have had a dinner with Doris at that time. I think uh, I might not have survived it, but <laughs> that's another story. But this car was, a, it's a car of two personalities, and I think she was too. By the time she was 26, she would inherited a boatload of money. 150 million from She's the richest woman in America. Richest woman in America at 26. Now, you have a car, she was obviously showy, she was a fashion icon, she was a girl about town, she enjoyed to party. So she would have liked to have shown herself off, which so you have the, the Landolet roof down if you want to be out there and to be seen. But when you didn't want to be seen, you could lift it up, cover yourself, driving around. And she used this car a lot. She used it to drive from her farm in New Jersey, Duke's farm, to her summer cottage <laughs> uh, on Bellevue at uh, Rough Point. And I mean, that's a five hour journey, uh, whether you're passengering or whether you're driving. And she was mostly passengering, I'm sure. And as a passenger, she had all the conveniences she could think of, radio, drinks cabinet, and, and just the, the, the comfort and, and, and luxury that's in the rear compartment of this car, which we'll, uh, which we'll show you. And it, it's something to think about the fact that this car, as you said, um, was something that offered the option of displaying yourself or not. And also for the time, there were showier cars yes, uh, that you could sure. buy at this time. Uh, Rolston specialized in a sort of, um, not exactly conservative, but a clean and honest sort of sober look. They weren't one of the flashy coach builders. No. Um, and that suited the time as well, um, quite, quite uh, correctly. But one of the things that's so interesting about this particular car is the fact that a young 26-year-old heiress could have bought, as you said, a sports car. Yeah. Could have bought a Duesenberg SSJ. <laughs> um, and actually, it's an interesting fact that I learned not long ago about this car, is that while this, of course, is a custom body, Rolston built a very similar design on a Duesenberg Model J chassis. Yes, indeed, exactly. Um, which is interesting, and I think that, frankly, this style suits the Packard more than the Duesenberg. Well, I've um, seen both cars, and I yeah. think you can certainly see the similarities. And I think you're absolutely right. This is the long chassis, it's the yes. longer length chassis, um, obviously built for limousines and uh, landolets and town cars. Um, and I think it's the perfect lines for that. It, it's, not too, it's not too overdone, if you like. Um, a lot of coach work on shorter chassis can be a little bit heavy. This is not. And you're talking about sports cars, it's certainly not a sports car. But it has a, it has a sporting air to it, I think. Well, it, it, it doesn't look formal. And that's the no. thing which is very, very interesting, very difficult to do in the design for a town car. Uh, we actually have a number of uh, cars in the Audrain collection. This one, 
the Duesenberg Model J Murphy, a town car that was built for Doris Duke's mother, yes. Madeline Holt Inman Duke. It's also a very elegant and sporty town car. Yeah. Um, so it's very interesting. Maybe it was something that ran in the Duke household. Oh, this I think idea Doris. Of, of elegant sportiness. I think you're absolutely right. Uh, elegant sportiness. I think that's Doris Duke. Yeah. She was frivolous. She was sporty, I'm sure. But she had, she'd been brought up in an extremely wealthy family, a very well-to-do family. Um, so she could, she had to have her uh, extravagances, but she also had to know when to reel it in. And I think that's it. And speaking of sporty, that brings us a great segue into our second car, this 1938 Ford. This Ford was built for Harold Sterling Vanderbilt, one of the greatest yacht racers America yeah. has known, former Commodore of the New York Yacht Club, and somebody who really exemplified the entire Vanderbilt lifestyle, horse racing and yacht racing. And um, this car, I'm also very, very happy, we are all very happy to say, was donated to the Audrain Automobile Museum by our great friend, Minnie Cushing Coleman. And uh, she was a neighbor of Harold Vanderbilt. And when he passed away, she was able to buy the car from uh, his widow. Wow. And so she used the car around Newport and uh, then donated it to us. How nice. And it's such an interesting car because you think about the Vanderbilt and how much money he had, but he bought a Ford in 1938 because he didn't want to be showy. But a Vanderbilt is not going to drive around in a standard Ford V8 Deluxe sedan. Not in, not at all. But it is a chauffeur-driven car. It has a partition. Mm -hmm. It has all of the fixings, if you like, in the rear uh, that you would want from a, a, a chauffeur-driven car. But it is small compared to a lot of the chauffeur-driven cars of the time. It is pretty small. But interestingly, um, bodied by Brewster. Yes. Um, at a time when Brewster was owned by uh, J.S. Inskip, mm -hmm. who had been brought up at Rolls-Royce. And interestingly, a few years before this was built, uh, Inskip had bought a number of Ford chassis, V8 chassis, and he had rebodied them and was selling them in Rolls-Royce's showrooms, mm -hmm. uh, especially in New York, as Brewsters. They were badged as Brewsters, but with Ford running gear. So obviously they had an eye to something rather more special than your average Ford. And it's very interesting that, uh, you know, me being such a student of coach building, and especially having looked at coach building before the war, or oh, coach building from the time cars were made, uh, before World War II, and then after, when coach building basically died off yeah. everywhere except for a few manufacturers in the UK, and interestingly enough, in Italy. Yes. Because the coach builders of Italy kept bodying cars they moved down from Azotto Fraschini's and, and the like to bodying Fiat's. And it was something that, it was very interesting and sort of fascinating for us to think of pre-war bodying, custom bodying Fords. But frankly, if the American coach building industry, such as it was, had continued to do custom bodied Fords, we might have gotten something like Fred Steele's 1950 Mercury from a coach from builder, a coach builder in instead themselves. of from a custom. It was very interesting. And one of the, going back to uh, the Brewsters, one of the first of those, I think the third one that built, was actually bought by Edsel Ford himself. So that's a great sort of pat on the back, pat on the shoulder to uh, Inskip and Brewster uh, about what a great job they'd done. And it's also quite interesting to consider these two cars and what they represented at the time, but also about Newport and the personalities. Yeah. Um, Doris Duke was a very young girl. Um, she had inherited a great tobacco fortune, which was one generation old. Her father made all the money. And the Vanderbilts, while certainly not an old family, went back three generations by the time you get to Harold Sterling Vanderbilt. So a Vanderbilt could ride around or be driven in a Ford. Yeah and not really miss anything. They had a nothing Duke, to, I think, needed a Packer. I think you're right. But <laughs> you know, the, the Vanderbilts had nothing to prove. They'd arrived. The world knew who they were. They didn't know, need to show it off. And I think this Ford really does do that job. And it's interesting when you talk about him and his history and his sporting prowess on the water and being a, an America's Cup uh, skipper. There are echoes, and it's very interesting. I saw this earlier. In the rear of the car, there is a grab handle Yes. And not just any old grab handle. It's basically a, a rope, a sheet or something that you would find on a yacht, beautifully done, 
and I'm sure that was uh, his personal choice. And another great uh, touch is the fact that the car is finished in the Vanderbilt horse racing colors. Yes, indeed. I think a lot of the well-to-do families of the day had their own colors. Uh, the Vanderbilts had the very deep maroon, mm -hmm. um, others had a deep navy blue, um, and, but this was, a Van, this was a Vanderbilt color. And very nice it is too. It's an absolutely extraordinary thing to uh, talk about. There's another aspect which we'll cover quickly, the fact that there are three cars in this exhibition that also have a very interesting relationship with their coach builders. Mm -hmm. This car, body by Rolston, which declared bankruptcy in April of 1938, probably very shortly after this car was finished, yeah. and went on to trade as Rolston. Yeah, without the T. Brewster had actually gone out of business by the time this Ford was finished, so yeah. it was very likely, like the earlier Brewster Ford, an in-skip car, but yeah. labeled Brewster. Yeah. And of course, the magnificent uh, Isotto Fraschini 8AS uh, Fleetwood uh, Cabriolet that's in this show, which we'll talk about in a uh, segment coming up, was bodied by Fleetwood, one of the last cars bodied by Fleetwood before they were bought by General Motors and yeah. became an in-house coach builder for General Motors. Yeah. So 10 years before these. Exactly. It is very interesting, the history of coach building. It's a, it's a subject that is fascinating. I'm sure we should talk some more about it if we had the time. But it, it is you know, gro moving from the carriage era, the horses and the being towed behind a horse or two or four or whatever you want, <laughs> um, to this. And then the post-war era, as you say, with Europe mostly predominantly building, uh, still building coach-built cars. And what a beautiful art form they are. Indeed and in fact. Thank you very <laughs> much, Nick. And now to something even more different. <laughs> And finally, we end with a motorcycle, because here at the Audrain, we celebrate vehicles on two and four wheels. And to do that, who better than our resident motociclista? Test dummy, you know. <laughs> Antonio Malegari. Antonio. Yeah. E, as you probably know, Antonio was born in Italy, in Brescia, the home of the Emilia. And who better to talk about not only a motorcycle, but an Italian motorcycle, an MV Augusta. Yeah, so we have a 77 MV Augusta 750S America. And of course, being an Italian bike, if it was a Japanese bike or an American bike, I'd probably walk by it, but because it's Italian, <laughs> I, I gravitate towards it. But these are special. I mean, they only made 540 of these bikes and uh, they were built to celebrate their uh, many championship wins. Uh, they stopped racing in 76. Mm -hmm. um, so you have a nice plaque here on the tank of their 37 uh, championship wins from, from over the years. And, and uh, it's quite the bike. And I know that you are a big fan of racing motorcycles and MotoGP and the racing you do yourself on your Ducati. And it's very interesting too, because this is a road going version, a detuned version of the MV Augusta race motorcycle. And it's really interesting because clearly this is a street bike. It's got the reflectors, it's got everything that, that says it's a street bike, but it also has a certain attitude that says, I'm not a cruiser. Yeah, 100%. I mean, it's got, it's got low bars. Uh, this, this seat at the time, you know, would have been the style of the racing seat that they would have used. Uh, the, uh, the foot controls are, are in a very aggressive position. So you're pretty leaned over this bike. Uh, this is pretty typical of the time where the seat to handlebar position, you really have to stretch yourself. Now you're more on top of the bike. Mm -hmm. Back then you kind of had to stretch out over it. Um, but this is a pretty, pretty fast machine. It could do about 130 miles an hour um, today. Very respectable for a street motorcycle. Yeah, yeah. Today, the most superbikes will do 130 in second or third gear, <laughs> but, but you know, it's crazy how much faster they've gotten in the last 50 years. But riding, I haven't ridden this, but I could imagine riding this would be a lot of fun and you could get a lot of thrills out of it. I know Leno has one and he's done a really good video on his YouTube channel where he really does a deep dive into it and 
and he takes it for a ride, and you can tell that he really, really loves it when he, when he rides this bike. Well, I'm sure our very generous uh, uh, loner, uh, John Lawless, would let you take this out anytime you want. So uh, I don't know if we want to take him up on that offer, because <laughs> maybe I won't return. <laughs> One of the other things that we talked about before we started shooting was the actual nomenclature on this motorcycle. 750, but in fact, it's not a 750. Yeah, it's actually 789cc. So, you know, sometimes uh, manufacturers will round up. In this case, they're rounding down. Um, and why is that? Well, I think, I think just to celebrate the, you know, 750cc uh, race bikes. They won a lot of championships on uh, 125, 350, and 500s. Uh, it looked like the racing was going to go to, to bigger engines, but ultimately they stayed 500cc two strokes. Um, that's kind of a whole separate story. But it's funny that they kind of rounded down for it. Yeah, we need to have that conversation because it's really quite interesting because you see that also in automobile racing where a GT3 racer will frequently have a smaller and lower horsepower engine than the street version, yeah, yeah. which is, seems to be counterintuitive, but it's not always about the size of the engine. It's about power to weight ratio, the way the engine produces its power. So that's a fascinating conversation, which we will have somehow, somewhere on this network. Yeah, yeah. Um, it also reminds me of something uh, in cars where Alfa Romeo, quite famously, was uh, very well noted for their 1930s, 1750 cc, 60, 1750 race cars. And when the Giulia GT grew up from its 1600 engine to the next size up, although it was an 1800 cc engine, they called it the 1750. <laughs> so that people, ah, they thought about those yeah. great Alfa race cars of yore. So. It's an interesting marketing uh, yeah, trick. Yeah, and I mean, you know, it. I think 750 sounds a lot better than 789. <laughs> I mean, it rolls off the tongue a little bit easier. I love the badge that they did. It's it's pretty creative. But, you know, MV and obviously I'm a, a big Ducati man. But my my story with MV is um, when I was a little kid, my dad would take me to the Italian Motorcycle Owners Club meeting and every year in, in the fall. And uh, the two bikes that I fell in love with, I mean, this would have been probably 01, 02. So I was just a little guy. And I remember falling in love with the 916, which I love mm -hmm. the Ducati 916, but also the MV Augusta 750 F4. So back in 98, they, they really made a, a pretty strong return to the motorcycle market with the uh, 750, uh, F4 750, and it was actually on display at the Guggenheim Museum. Mm -hmm. They did a motorcycle exhibit in 98. An amazing exhibition, an yeah. amazing exhibition that, that really sort of turned my head when it came to motorcycles. Yeah, yeah, and you know, every time I, I see an F4, and this kind of reminds me of, you know, the styling, the, the styling cues are, are similar, but seeing the F4 as a child, every time I see one, I'm just like totally in awe. And they've really brought uh, a, a great flavor of new bikes into the market. Uh, they're starting to do these uh, retro designs mm -hmm. in their newer bikes. So they're utilizing all modern technology and, and you know, quick shifters and traction control and all of these like cool pieces of tech that all the bikes have now. But they have this uh, really cool uh, round headlight and the fairings kind of look like old bikes and they have this beautiful round tail light on one of their newer bikes. And I actually got to meet uh, basically their hero, Giacomo Agostini, we have a quote <laughs> from him up here at Goodwood in 21. I remember that yeah. quite well. I turned to look to see where you'd gone and you disappeared. Like, yeah. There was this whole row of great uh, race motorcycles and it's like, oh my God, and you were gone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was pretty speechless and it was super cool to, to meet him because, I mean, at the time, I think he was 78 or 79 years old, and he was riding the new version of the Super Veloce. And at first I, I saw that, but then I saw him, and I was like blown away that, that he was even there. And uh, I went up to him, and, I, and you could tell, you know, there's a lot of people there, and, and it's like, oh, here's another fan. Not in, a, not in a bad way, but, you know, he's getting ready to ride, and he's getting ready to do the hill climb. And I started speaking to him in Italian, and, and I told him that, I was born in Brescia, and he's also born in, in Brescia, and it was very cool to speak to well, him. Well, the Bresciano. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was very cool to speak to him in Italian, and then at the gala with the, the Duke's fireworks, he and I actually watched them together, and we had a nice conversation, and that was a very, very cool moment to, you know, speak to 
the greatest motorcycle racer of all time. Of course, my heart says Valentino Rossi, <laughs> but he's the greatest motorcycle racer of all time. This is an example of an actual instance when you meet your hero and it's a good thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. He's a very, very nice guy. It was cool. Well, that is a, a little bit of an insight, again, about the fact that we celebrate the vehicles, yes, but the people even more. So thank you very much, Antonio. And thank you all for watching this and come back to our channel to see our next highlights video from History Luxury Sport, Automobiles and Motorcycles in Newport. Thanks.